can everybody hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, so thank you very much, Su Yao. Um, a very good morning to everyone, and thank you to the Education University of Hong Kong and the Asia Pacific Public Policy Network for having us here to present today. So as mentioned, my colleague, Professor Pauline Strawn, and I will be presenting our paper titled COVID-19 and Older Adults, the Need for Targeted Interventions for Wellbeing, written in conjunction with our colleagues from the Singapore Management University, Grace Chong and Wen Si Lim. So to begin our presentation, I will first provide a quick overview of the timeline of the pandemic in Singapore last year. Um, as can be seen, the first COVID-19 case in Singapore was recorded in January last year. Uh, as the pandemic gradually worsened, the Singapore government released a total of four budgets in the first half of the year that provided financial assistance to businesses, individuals, and households alike. Um, these budgets were released consecutively in the months of February, March, April, and May last year. And immediately after the third budget was released, Singapore's circuit breaker or lockdown began on the 7th of April. Now this lasted until the 2nd of June, after which the Singapore government implemented its three-phase plan for reopening. Um, in each phase, the government gradually allowed for more social activities to resume. So for instance, in phase two of the reopening, Singaporeans were allowed to dine out in groups of five and in phase three, government has noted that phase three, which began on the 28th of December last year, is not likely to end anytime soon, and early guesses estimate that it will last at least to the end of the year. So what we are looking at here is really Singapore's shift or transition to the new normal, which started when Singapore's circuit break ended. Um, many social activities such as religious activities have been allowed to resume in phase three, albeit with uh, restrictions. So things have definitely not returned to pre-COVID days. Um, Given that this is likely to continue, that it is, uh, it is therefore important to understand how older adults have transitioned into this new normal. So what exactly about the well-being of older adults are we interested in looking at? Uh, early commentators on the pandemic pointed out that many groups of individuals were being unequally affected by COVID-19. Uh, this was true not just in terms of the immediate or direct health impacts of COVID-19, but also in terms of the indirect impacts of the pandemic brought about due to measures put in place to contain the virus. Now, older adults were one such group argued to be more vulnerable to both of these impacts. Uh, in terms of the direct health impacts, it has been well established that older adults are more likely to experience severe symptoms if they contract COVID-19 as compared to younger individuals. Um, in terms of the wider effects of the pandemic on older adults, however, uh, this has not been empirically examined as thoroughly as of yet. Uh, although uh, several preliminary arguments have been made. So, for instance, it has been argued that uh, due to the fact that older adults are more likely to be living alone, they are more likely to face, they are, have faced greater levels of loneliness and psychological or mental distress as a result of measures put in place to contain the pandemic. Um, another argument that has been made is that older adults uh, are less able to use communications technologies which, are, which would help them to cope with social uh, restrictions on social activities. And finally, older adults have also been argued to uh, have experienced greater disruptions to their usual services. So for instance, in Singapore, uh, public social activities at community centers for older adults were put on hold very early on in the pandemic uh, due to the increased vulnerability of older adults to the virus. Now, this was even before our lockdown began and also before social activities for other populations were halted. And this deprived older adults of a very important avenue for social engagement and interaction. And it's just likely to have had uh, severe impacts on their social well-being. So although such arguments have been made regarding the wider impact of COVID-19, um, however, they have yet to be substantiated with empirical findings in the way that the direct impacts have been studied. And so there is definitely a gap in the knowledge here that needs to be better understood. And doing so, as mentioned, is all the more important, especially as countries begin to move into the new normal or the protracted or extended period of the pandemic. So this brings us to our current research, which was driven uh, predominantly by the following three research questions. Firstly, how has older adult well-being fared during COVID-19? What are the factors that have exacerbated COVID-19's impact on older adult well-being, especially with regards to social isolation? And finally, how have the government's responses to COVID-19 in Singapore impacted older adult well-being? Now to answer these questions, we have relied on data from the Singapore Life Panel at the Center for Research on Successful Aging or ROSA. 
Um, the Singapore Life Panel is a, or SLP, is a population representative monthly survey of an average of 7,500 older adults aged 55 to 74 in the year 2020. Now, importantly, the SLP has been running since 2015 and utilizes an online platform for the completion of surveys. Um, this means that even during the lockdown and in the immediate aftermath of the lockdown, when movement was still and social activities were still tightly controlled, the SLP was still able to gather data from respondents. Um, the monthly frequency of the survey also allowed for the feeding of specific modules on COVID-19 immediately or almost immediately, which was done from April 2020 onwards. Um, so the SLP has basically enabled us to track quite closely the impact of COVID-19 on older adult well-being in Singapore over the entire pandemic, as we will show later. Uh, in particular, the SLP data uh, allows us to provide an empirical critique of the argument shared earlier, which is what we intend to present today. So just to give you a better idea of uh, what the SLP is about, here's a quick snapshot of the demographic profile of our SLP respondents in November last year. So as mentioned, we have an average of 7,500 respondents per month. And in the month of November, we had exactly 7,598 respondents, giving us a response rate of 64.7% for that month. Um, now, there's a lot to go over here in this slide, but the main point that I would like to highlight is that the sample is, as I mentioned, uh, population representative, and the proportions in the SLP uh, displayed in the slide are close to the proportions in the wider public for older adults uh, in the similar age range uh, in Singapore. So now I'll be going into a brief overview of the various instruments that were fielded to measure the constructs for this study. Um, our primary dependent variable was well-being, and this was measured in terms of overall life satisfaction. So respondents were asked to rate their overall satisfaction with life on a five-point Likert scale. The second dependent variable we were interested in looking at was felt or subjective social isolation or loneliness. Um, this was measured in terms of the frequency that respondents felt socially isolated and participants similarly answered on a five point Likert scale. Uh, we also looked at living arrangements as we were definitely interested in comparing the differences in well-being among older adults living alone and those living with co-residents. So the sample was split into these two groups. Uh, next, we have communications technologies, both in terms of both uh, both in terms of the usage of such communications technologies, as well as the frequency of digital communications with uh, friends and family. So, in terms of usage, respondents were asked to indicate uh, which of six forms of communications technologies they use to keep in touch with their friends and loved ones. Um, this uh, the sample was subsequently split into two groups. Uh, the first containing uh, those who only used one or did not use any form of communication, and those who used two or more. Um, in terms of the frequency of contact, respondents were asked how often they communicated with friends and family digitally, and answered on a five-point Likert scale. Uh, finally, we have participation in in-person social activities. So, participants rated their frequency of participation in seven activities. For instance, uh, visiting friends and family or religious activities, and rated their frequency of participation in each activity on a five-point Likert scale. Um, the scores for the seven activities were subsequently summed to create an overall social activity score or index. And finally, we also added in the following controls in our analysis, namely subjective health status, uh, race, gender, age, years of education, housing type, income, and employment status. So moving on to the first part of our findings, an overview of the trends in well-being among older adults during COVID-19. First, we look at the overall trend in well-being uh, or life satisfaction among the SLP over the year 2020. Uh, so as can be seen, there was a quite a significant dip in the levels of well-being among the SLP in April 2020, which was precisely when the circuit breaker or lockdown began in Singapore. Um, after the circuit breaker ended in June, we do see, uh, we do observe that well-being did recover slightly. However, well-being has importantly not returned to pre-COVID levels, which can be seen in the months of January and February. 
in fact, we, we do see that well-being has almost plateaued after the circuit breaker ended and during the transitionary period at a level that is below pre-COVID levels of well-being. And this was true even after Singapore entered phase three of the reopening, which allowed for the most uh, social activities to occur at the end of December, uh, which even saw a slight decline in well-being in, in January 2021. Now, this indicates for us or suggests for us that older adults are indeed uh, likely to still be facing impediments to their overall well-being even after the lockdown ended. So next, we dove a little deeper and compared the well-being of those living alone to those living with other co-residents. Um, as can be seen, the well-being of those living alone represented by the green line is consistently lower than that of those living with co-residents uh, throughout the pandemic. It also appears that those living alone experience slightly steeper declines in well-being during the lockdown. And also of interest is the fact that the well-being of those living with co-residents was brought down to the level of those living alone during normal times uh, when the circuit breaker started, um, which illustrates the significant impact that the lockdown had on the well-being of older adults, regardless of whether they lived alone or not. We also looked at the well-being. Uh, we also looked at well-being according to the number of communications technologies that our respondents used. Um, as can be seen, those who used only one or did not use any form of communications technologies to keep in touch with their friends and family reported lower levels of well-being consistently, as uh, represented by the blue line. Now we can also see that the gap in well-being between the two groups has widened since the pandemic began and during the transitionary period uh, after the lockdown. Um, the differences in levels of well-being between the two groups possibly indicates that being able to use a greater number of forms of communications technologies made it easier for older adults to maintain contact with friends and family and to, also, uh, and to socially interact during the lockdown despite uh, restrictions on social activities, therefore helping them to cope with these restrictions. And finally, we looked at the differences in well-being between those who could and have still remained relatively social act socially active and those who are not able to continue participating in in-person social activities. So as can be seen, there's a wide difference in well-being of the two groups, uh, with those who are able to continue social activities reporting higher levels of well-being. Um, this difference in well-being has grown even wider in the months following the circuit breaker during the transitionary period into the new normal. Now, this suggests that uh, the importance of engaging in in-person social activities for one's well-being. Um, the increasing divide in well-being between the two groups after the circuit breaker ended could also be due to the fact that many businesses and companies implemented and continue to implement uh, work-from-home policies during the pandemic. Uh, this may perhaps make engaging in social activities all the more important for, well -being, for the well-being of older adults as they lose the opportunity, the very important opportunity to socialize at work. Now, these preliminary descriptive analyses identified several key factors in determining older adult well-being during the pandemic, uh, namely living arrangements, the use of communications technologies, and the frequency of engagement in social activities. Uh, for this reason, we decided to carry out a deep dive analysis of the factors mitigating the impact living alone has on well-being for older adults using PATH analysis. And the results of our deep dive will now be presented by my colleague, Professor Strong. Thank you very much, Micah. So if you go into the next slide with the path analysis model, these are the hypotheses that we tested. Primarily, we were most concerned with those who were living alone because the pandemic with its social distancing um, measures meant that if you didn't have a co-resident, you would be by your lonely self 24-7, right? Um, we don't, we can't, we can't change, uh, intervene with living arrangements because those are either by circumstance or choice, private arrangements. So it's very important then from an evidence-based perspective to see what are the mitigating factors that could be streamed in to alleviate um, the, the dampening of well-being in such pandemic crisis. So we tested several hypotheses using um, structure equation modeling. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, Micah, here are the outcomes. Right. Um, first, let me draw attention to the red boxes. We see that indeed, those who live alone 
have a higher sense of perceived self-isolation, self so a perceived sense of loneliness, and that has a negative impact on well-being. We also see that if you were still socially engaged, right? Um, and this is two dimensions here. Um, either you had frequent con contact with people outside of your household via the various forms of uh, information uh, communications technology, then that would improve your well being uh, records. Similarly, for those who lived alone, if they continue to participate in social activities, so you see that positive uh, significant path there, then through engagement in social activities, you would also see that there is a negative uh, impact on sense of loneliness and a positive impact on life satisfaction. So I'm going to pause here for a moment and from you know, a translational research perspective, uh, to take in what the evidence is telling us. So how do we then leverage these findings? Uh, next slide, Mika. So these are just the model uh, performance indicators to show that um, the models, I mean, we ran several, several models, right? Um, model speaks well um, in terms of, so this is in M plus, uh, adjusted R squared, the R squared, uh, for predicting life satisfaction is uh, 0.436. So we're quite pleased with the uh, outcomes. Next slide, Michael. So our findings tell us that life satisfaction uh, as one indicator of well-being is influenced by feelings of social uh, perceived social isolation and frequency of contact with significant others and participation in social activities. Taken together then, in terms of what can be done uh, in the implications for policy intervention, uh, the takeaway would be to ensure that seniors remain socially integrated and socially active in order to safeguard their well being. Further, we are most concerned about seniors who live alone. Um, I believe Hong Kong statistics are, are not, not that different, but in Singapore, uh, we have uh, about 17% now who live alone. And we expect that this proportion in the population would, uh, set, would be set to increase because of the demographic shifts, right? With uh, more remaining single. And for those who marry, uh, their family sizes remain small and we see a growing proportion of double income, no kids. So looking at those who are living alone, of course, we understand that there's greater risk of, you know, uh, so sense of social isolation. So policymakers would have to stream on targeted approaches towards engaging, you know, in innovatively, right, cur curating social engagement opportunities in the neighborhoods and communities to engage greater participation um, in social activities. And finally, one thing that uh, COVID-19 has highlighted for us in Singapore is the great digital divide. Um, the 12 months seems like 12 years. <laughs> I've, I've, I'm, 50, I'm 57, right? I've never seen Singapore disrupted in this manner. And for the first time, you know, we see step up in innovations. There's a lot of activity on the technological front. We all downloaded apps of various kinds to order food, order groceries, you know, you watch uh, live auctioning of fish in the market so that you can have them delivered to you and so forth. So most of us were able to resume some sense of normalcy because we had our smart devices. But for the older adults, we saw that big, huge gap. They could not come on board, right? Um, so this uh, alerted us to immediate interventions that had to be rolled out. So we had a very important initiative called Seniors Go Digital, right? Where we are now focusing a lot of attention on bringing the seniors on board on the digital transformation. Next slide, please, Micah. So given that we are speaking with uh, many esteemed colleagues uh, from outside of Singapore, I thought it would be useful to end um, with just a short overview on the policy initiatives that had taken place in the past 12 months. Next slide. 
So if you had followed the news, uh, this was a big deal for us. The Singapore government dipped into reserves several times last year for the first time in a very, very long time. Um, we had not one, but four budgets last year because of the pandemic. Um, the first budget, the unity budget, was the regular uh, annual budget you know, that our budget start, cycle starts uh, at the end of February, early March. So that was a uh, fairly um, broad-based budget, uh, typical you know, annual budget that looks after all facets of, of, of the economy and the community. Then come, came February and our, our world, like like, like yours fell apart, right? Because COVID-19 hit us and hit us very hard. So immediately two other budgets were released and they were still purely, um, they were broadly, you know, ba uh, large base and uh, but responding specifically to, to the impact of COVID-19 and focused on businesses to protect jobs and to protect workers. And then when we were in the midst of the circuit breaker, and this was uh, pretty much uh, one of the lowest point that we had you know, observed in Singapore, then the fortitude budget was rolled out. So this was the fourth budget in one year. Um, and the $33 million billion budget focused on building up resilience and it was a more targeted uh, support package. Next slide, Michael. So if we map this onto the well-being um, map for the year, we see that our policy response um, in, in many, on many fronts was a response to how Singaporeans you know, were hit by COVID, right? So each step of the way, government reached out to uh, allay fears and concerns and ensured that population ensured Singaporeans that you know government was par partnering us in our you know in, in this pandemic and you can see that the last budget that was rolled up was in May 2020 uh, when we were in the midst of the circuit breaker and then things started to pick up once the circuit breaker ended. Uh, next slide Michael. So when we took a step back um, to look at you know, our policy approach, we found a synergy with uh, Powell's targeted universal approach um, in dealing with a pandemic, right? There are three steps. The first would be a universal public policy goal for the population. Uh, typically, you know, what happens uh, whenever we deal with the annual budget uh, release. And then uh, the next step would be to look at barriers that are faced by most people in the community to mitigate uh, the various aspects of COVID-19. And finally, and we are in that third stage right now, um, to look at more targeted strategies because there will be groups who need help a little bit more than the others. So um, we have just uh, been, uh, we're now in the 2021 budget cycle. So the budget for 2021 has just been released and much of that is focused on uh, phase three, which is a targeted approach, identifying industries that were still lagging behind, for example, aviation and tourism, and looking at the gaps, you know, that uh, specific groups of Singaporeans, like those, you know, um, we have highlighted in our uh, findings, uh, may need some more intervention. Uh, final slide, Michael. So we, at ROSA, we have a lot of data, right? We have 67 waves of data and that translates out to more than half a million uh, data points, meaning surveys, right? Because we've been collecting data, you know, now we are in our sixth year. Um, so what we do is we offer evidence-based perspective of where the gaps are and then draw attention of policymakers to how these gaps can be plugged. And then we follow up right, on, on the outcomes of the intervention. So our data uh, generally suggests the efficacy of targeted interventions in, in ensuring the well-being, particularly of older adults. We also take a more holistic approach towards well-being. Um, we go beyond economic well-being, which is the most common concern, right? Uh, beyond physical health well-being, 
and um, we have uh, equal emphasis on psychological and social well-being. So we believe that intervention should not just be economic in nature, but social psychological as well. And in particular, as we look forward to receiving an aging population, I think um, this is uh, the COVID has has provided us with with I think sharper lenses on how you know what it means to be prepared to receive an aging population and what kind of targeted interventions would be crucial as we continue to value the older members of our population. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor John and uh, Micah. Uh, very inspiring presentation uh, and, and sharing. I think, uh, yeah, I find a lot of findings very important. Uh, I'm particularly well, particularly regarding, you know, like how intervention should be done, the nature of intervention shouldn't just be about economic aid, but also uh, focus, should also focus on um, the social, uh, psychological and social well-being of people. Um, so, well, um, yeah, I will take this opportunity um, to have a number of follow-up questions and see if the audience have some questions as well. Um, my question, well, one of the questions that I am very interested in is, is that, well, it, from your results is, we see great divide between, between amongst the respondents um, in terms of life satisfaction. And this, I find this very striking because um, I, I think that, well, since the survey is done online, so your respondents should have got some access to internet anyway. So they, they are more, like well prepared technologically, uh, than than the usual, you know, you know, than, than some of the people, than some of the population. So 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 the fact that there is still a great divide in terms of uh, life satisfaction is striking to me. Um, so in this relation, I I am just interested in how 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 did you recruit the the panel uh, participants? Um, is it probabilistic or non probabilistic? Thank you. Um, thank you. That's a very important question, and it speaks to the validity of the SLP. Um, it is a probability sample. Mm. So what we do is, um, this was done, the sample was first recruited uh, six years ago, right, mm. by my predecessor, uh, Bryce and, uh, Hull and his uh, team. Uh, so we got a representative sample from the Department of Statistics household addresses and typical uh, survey recruitment, door-to-door -door knocking to make sure that the identified households, you know, would participate and join the panel. So you are right in that not everyone uh, would, was prepared to go digitally, right? Because uh, Singapore is a very diverse community with uh, Chinese, Malay, uh, Indian members, um, the, uh, ethnically, you know, uh, very, very diverse. So um, we do have uh, an army of <laughs> research assistants and student assistants. Students are very precious to us, right? Um, so every month, uh, we do have a team on standby. They would, be, they would be there to help those who need help to log on um, and to uh, complete the survey. And if they need help, they would do door visits or they would invite the participants to sit down with them uh, with a tablet, right? And guide them you know, on, on, onto the survey platform. The survey is administered um, in uh, different languages. So uh, every month, yeah, my life is, is not very smooth. Like every month, it's like, you know, most of us do, so when we do quantitative research, like oh, you, you, you have six months to ride up to the survey. And then after that, you have another two months to do pilots and relax a bit. <sighs> At Rosa, every month, okay, we have no nonstop, right? We are testing, we are piloting, translating, going to IRB. Um, so um, it, it is a very, uh, it's a setup that has, um, come a long way and um, I, I, my team is very privileged, you know, to be driving it right now. And we will be refreshing the panel um, mm -hmm. in a two months time when once the circuit, uh, once the social distancing measures are relaxed somewhat, then we will be recruiting the 50 to 54 group because we want to make sure that we capture um, our target population as they are approaching preparation for retirement. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much, Professor John. That, that's very impressive. Uh, 
Wait, I can see. I see. There is one question is in the chat room. Oh, from Studi. Uh, perhaps Studi, you can. Oh, I, so I was. It's just again very related to what's here. Um, are the respondents compensated in any way for their time? Mm, uh, yes, they are. So every every month we would give them um, a voucher um, to thank them for their time. So mm -hmm. um, the we have twelve months. Uh, every month, you know, there will be a survey. But the twelve, the twelve, the twelve touch points are broken up into uh, you know shorter, you know, touch points where the vouchers would be a smaller amount to deeper dives because um, you know. When, when sociologists, psychologists, and economists sit together, the questionnaire is pretty long, right? So <laughs> there's a lot of bargaining <laughs> in our meetings. We meet every, every Monday, right? There's a lot of bargaining going on to whose questions go on now. Um, so, and of course, because, um, so, so to answer your question, yes, um, they are compensated in terms of just, just a voucher, right? To, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, to thank them for their time. But I think as we grow our relationship with our Singapore Life Panel, so the Life Panel has um, at this point about 11,000 members of which uh, about 7.5 thousand would regularly uh, come back to us every month in the survey. So the response rate is uh, hovering, hovers around 70% each month. Incredibly high. Yeah. So what we do is we try to grow a relationship with them. Um, so we feed them information as well, right? So every uh, three months, we send them a newsletter. So all the findings that we have, we distill them, and then we inform them of where we have informed for interventions and, and to seek their feedback as well. Thank you. Right. That's very exciting uh, to have such high quality data. Um, okay. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I wonder if there are any further questions? Oh, if not, then maybe we can proceed there's to the. Question, uh, sorry, oh. Celia, there's a question in the QA chat box. Oh, really? Okay. Let's take a look. All right. Okay. So the question is Are there any differences among their attributes, such as gender, working, or retired? I would also like to know about the late elderly as well. So that's from the attendance, attendees. Um, I, so we controlled for all that because we were zooming in, right, on um, all, all where the interventions with the mediators are. But certainly, yes, we do see uh, differentials um, in social economic status divide. And um, um, we, I, I, I think that, that so, so we take that same approach, right? Um, living alone, for example, that, that is uh, living arrangements uh, at this point tends to be an SES indicator as well, because those who live alone also tend to be from the lower end of the SES spectrum. So um, we do see the differences, definitely. And then the question we raise would be, what is it about being less well off that impedes well-being? Or what is it about, you know, being a, a woman? you know, that, that impedes well-being. So um, in another paper that my colleague had presented, uh, he was the, my, my uh, psych, psycho, psychologist and he, he, we were testing the resilience scale that we had uh, streamed on. And he found that, um, surprise, surprise, Males were more resilient than females. And of course, you know, there was a big hoo-ha in the, in the discussion. How can that be? Women are stronger. Um, but the evidence speaks as such. So now we are investigating, you know, uh, things like who is more likely to have caregiving burdens, right? Chances are, uh, well, the status is, is women, right? So therefore, you know, how does that then impact resilience? Which resilience is a very important uh, resource right we we want to be able to build resilience in the in the population so that they can you know face the next pandemic uh so a short answer to the question is yes definitely all right thank you very much um so yeah uh let's proceed to the next presentation uh and by inviting professor kili chow to share his findings on on the on the um on finding a identifying uh, proper products for the elderly. 
and retirement. So uh, may I now invite Professor Gili Zhao uh, to start okay. his presentation. Thank you. Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, could you see my PowerPoint? Not yet. Not yet? Um, now we can. Oh. Mm. Let me try again. No, no, it works just now. It works just oh, now. It doesn't. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, can you see it now? Okay. Uh, first of all, I'm 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 sorry that um uh, when I saw the um schedule. Um, I realized everybody uh, talking about uh, COVID-19. So I think I should um, talk about this topic too. So I just changed the title of my presentation. Um, um, so um, this one is about, uh, we just get a, a large grant from the, um, RTC is called a uh, one-off collaborative research fund, and and COVID-19 uh, special round in uh, 2020 and 2021. And um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's I think it's the first time our, our university could get this grant, and it's a, a five million dollar grant for two years time. So we are very excited and. Uh, I would like to share with you uh, what are we going to do um, to help the older people uh, in this difficult time. Um, so uh, we will start our study in, um, in June. And we are very busy now to prepare the questionnaire and the intervention. So, the purpose of this study, as you can see in the topic, is to protect the older adult from loneliness. So, um, as you uh, can imagine, um, the because of the pandemic, uh, we impose many social distance uh, measures, and it hit hard to older adults. And one of the outcome is the, um, they feel lonely because of the, those uh, social distance measures. And before that, uh, in my previous study, I, I found that um, loneliness is quite common in our older adults. Almost, mo almost uh, half of them sometimes or always feel lonely. So it's a very uh, common problem. Uh, so, um, um, and, and why we want to focus on lonely, not just because it's common, because of its um, negative consequence on the mental health and physical health among the older adults. And uh, it will uh, lead to depressive symptoms, um, suicide, uh, poor cognitive functioning, uh, some heart disease, or even uh, death. And we found, and um, I just like uh, the uh, Pauline and, and Mike, they emphasize the living alone. We think that this uh, and, and no access to internet are two um, major risk factor for them to feel lonely. So we would like to highlight this. Beside these two uh, vulnerable factors, we also think that those who are living in poverty will hit harder by, uh, compared with other older adults, which are quite better, uh, better off. So our objective is to develop effective intervention, psycho-intervention to reduce loneliness amongst those people who are living alone, living in poverty, and low access to internet. So it's very important that uh, the intervention can be scaled up 
in a short period of time during the uh, pandemic period of time. So we want we 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 try to mobilize the retirees, um, better education one, to implement the psycho social intervention. So there's like the older help older adult help older adult, and it, because of that is a peer intervention, so it more, could be more effective and more acceptable. And we also know that being a volunteer could have a benefit effect on those volunteers themselves. And But that evidence has not been um, uh, in, uh, investigated in Hong Kong. And we also believe that uh, being a volunteer could have a benefit effect on the loneliness of those uh, volunteer. So um, then we decide to do a deal RCT. It means that two RCT we will do at the same time. The first RCT is try to investigate the impact of two psychosocial intervention. One is mindfulness, and the second one is behavioral activation, compared with a control group, which is called befriending. And the second RCT is we try to investigate the impact of being a volunteer on loneliness. So it's double two RCT will be implemented at the same time. So there are four objectives of this study. The first one, as I say, we try to evaluate the impact of behavioral activation and mindfulness intervention on loneliness, on some uh, primary outcome, including loneliness, social network, and social support, and other secondary outcomes such as stress, sleeping quality, anxiety, and depressive symptoms. Amongst almost 1,000 older adults who are living alone, feel lonely, no access to internet, and living in poverty. And the second one is, as I say, to erase the six months volunteer work of those older adults who are willing to be the volunteer who deliver the mindfulness and behavioral activation intervention on those participants in the first RCT. And we will include 300 older adults. They will be randomly assigned into two groups. One is the one who deliver the psychosocial intervention to those participants in the first RCT. And the second one, they will just receive some psychoeducation on retirement on, or physical health in general. And we also want to know the mechanism of the uh, psycho social intervention, namely the mindfulness and behavioral, act behavioral activation and the volunteer effect under the skin. So we will assess the impact of those interventions on two biomarkers, the cortisol and CLTP, two physiological mechanism, which may, may underline the impact of loneliness on physical health amongst older adults. And the fourth one is also very exciting that we can try to find the interaction between the genetic markers and the psycho intervention effect on loneliness in the first RCT. So it's the first time we've tried to find whether any people with 
particular genetic marker um, could be benefit more from mindfulness or behavioral activation compared with other without that genetic marker. So it's gene environment interaction effect by uh, experimental design by RCT. So I think it's the first time we do that. So as I say, there's a three, inter, inter, three groups in the first RCT. One is behavioral activation. That winter, inter, uh, intervention is, was developed by one of our members, Professor Choi in UT Austin. The second one is the mindfulness developed by a colleague in, in uh, Lindsay in US. And we also adopt one uh, a Dr. Cox at Hong Kong U, which uh, she also, also uh, found that the mindfulness could reduce the depressive and anxiety symptoms among older people with Parkinson's disease. And the third group is the control group, which will receive defending intervention. Defending just means that we will have volunteer visit the participant regularly and just talk about something they uh, want to talk about. The second, the, 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 so uh, it's a, the sample is random sampling and the assessment, we have four, at least four assessment baseline, four weeks, three months and six months. And then the measure, as I say, divided to primary outcomes and secondary outcomes. And it's the full chart for it. And the second one, in our previous study, we have found that uh, go for a eight hour intervention motivation, we will promote more, more older adults engage in volunteer work from staff uh, increased from 15 minutes all the way to six hours. So we are confident that we could prom promote the volunteer work in what uh, retire in Hong Kong. And then we will have to do the second RCT. As I say, there are two groups, one is those who will be motivated to do the volunteer work. In, uh, in this case, they will learn how to deliver the intervention, the mindfulness, behavioral activation, and befriending to those who feel lonely in our first, in, in the, among the participants in our first RCT. And as I say, 300 older adults will be recruited and they will be randomly assigned to those two groups, volunteer group and the psychoeducation group. So also they will require to do the volunteer for at least six months and each month at least eight hours. And they will go through at least three assessment baseline six months and 12 months. And the measurement is almost the same as the one in um, the first RCT, divided into primary and secondary outcomes. So it's the full chart for the second RCT. And the third is related to the biomarkers. Because as you know, may know, is uh, to um, measure to analyze the biomarkers, very, very, very expensive. So we could only conduct the measurement of biomarker among 300 participants in the, in the first RCT and 150 participants in the second RCT. And they will, uh, each of them in each data collection assessment, they will, they will 
we collect at least three samples during one day. And, and, and we will analyze it. Analyze it. And the, the, to achieve the, the fourth objective, we will also collect the saliva from all the participants in the first RCT for genetic analysis. The outcome measure will be loneliness, and we will use three genetic analysis method. First, candidate gene. Second, genome-wide association study. And the third one, we will try to identify a particular biological pathway related to particular gene to try to analyze whether the interaction will affect between the genetic marker and the intervention on loneliness. So um, that's the deliver. Hopefully, we can find which cycle social intervention is the most effective among of those three to reduce loneliness among other adults in Hong Kong who are the most vulnerable to loneliness. And the second one, we could find a method, namely to recruit retirees to deliver those psycho intervention, whether to see is feasible and see whether there's impact on engage those um, volunteer work on them on themselves, the volunteer themselves, uh, especially the loneliness, in particular loneliness. So um, also we could identify the uh, some biological mechanism and the genetic. So um, so um, I think um, I want to um, share with you that uh, we, we luckily get, get this ground maybe because we we have a very beautiful design, have a two RCT to be conduct at the same time. And not much people uh, um, uh, emphasize the loneliness. And then we could able to uh, mobilize some um, untapped human resources. In this case, the retirees to implement the psycho social educate as uh, a psychosocial intervention, and and we uh, also we are almost the first one to find try to find a genetic environmental environment uh, environment interaction effect on loneliness, doing by doing our experimental design. So it's a, a collaboration with a lot of people. Um, our colleagues in um, special education department, um, colleagues in city university, colleagues in um, University of Hong Kong, um, colleagues in UT Austin, University of Aust uh, Austin, uh, University of Texas at, uh, at, at Austin, and Berlin Medical uh, University. So uh, I, uh, that's my presentation. And, and, and um, I hope that you could have um, um, any uh, suggestion to improve our study because we, we are not yet start and we will start it in June. So if you have any uh, comment and suggestion, uh, please, uh, Go ahead, ahead and tell me. Um, it's most welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. For the uh, I yeah, I am. I can see a little of connection between your study and and Professor Zhang's uh, 
talks just now, which both address um, the issue of loneliness. And, and these studies, uh, I'm looking forward to the findings uh, because it seems to such a, it seems to uh, be able to tell us a lot about the mecha mechanism between how loneliness affect well-being. So, um, so again, I, I, I think we can have a like 10 to five minutes discussion here before we put, move to um, another presentation. So I would just see if there are any questions for Professor Zhao at the moment. Uh, uh, sorry, um, for those who are interested in uh, my presentation about the uh, takeaway of welfare scheme and um, stigma, I think uh, the, the conference um, organization group, uh, they, they could send you the PowerPoint and I could also send you the PowerPoint. And uh, if you have any question, you can just uh, email me. Um, because my colleagues uh, is, uh, are one of our co-investigator is already preparing the paper. So maybe we could send you a draft paper if you are really interested. Thank you. Thank you. If I may uh, raise a comment uh, for Professor uh, Chow. Oh, I tell you, uh, we had goosebumps when we were listening to your presentation because this is exactly what we are doing at ROSA as well. Um, it is, uh, uh, I think, two important uh, synergies that we share with you. The first is the realization that volunteerism is an important resource that we need to capitalize on. And second, you know, the appreciation that not all recipients, like in this case, isolated um, uh, elderly, are passive consumers, right? We, we tend to approach, you know, in the in interventions uh, in a very traditional way, run massive programs, roll it down and expect people to sign up. Um, I think that is uh, not respectful, right, of the assets that uh, older adults bring with them as they move into the third age. So, um, what we, what, uh, so what we can uh, do is we'll follow up with you and um, perhaps we could share with you some of the indicators that we have developed, um, like um, a scale on um, uh, resilience, right? Uh, it's an index that we have validated. And then also cognitive tests, because our hypothesis is that as they engage, right, we should be able to see improvement in some of these psychosocial indicators. Um, and then we can do uh, pre-post tests and maybe we can compare across uh, Hong Kong and Singapore. Thank you so much, Prof Chow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, we also include the cognitive uh, capacity measure, um, marker, uh, into our assessment. So hopefully we could find some um, funding related to cognitive capacity. We will be in touch with you. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, okay, Studi. Sorry, I just, um, just one thing, this is so incredibly interesting, uh, but I was just wondering uh, about RCT2, which uh, is trying to look at the effect of volunteering on, um, is trying to evaluate the effect of volunteering, but I feel that RCT2 would also capture the effect of the first intervention because you're volunteering in mindfulness-based training. So I don't think, so I think the effect that it would capture would be the effect of volunteering plus mindfulness-based training because even when you're imparting training in mindfulness, you're um, partaking in mindfulness activities in the first place. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an excellent um, question. You know, when we, when I was interviewed by the panel, one of them, one of, one of uh, the panel member excited raised this question. And I, I don't have a perfect answer for it. But uh, we just could, uh, after that, I, I, we think about it, our research team think about it. So what we want to uh, try to do is, um, we have 150, 150, mm -hmm participant in the volunteer group in the second RCT, right? So we divide them into three groups. Each of them is only learn and deliver one intervention, okay? So one for BA, one for mindfulness, one for befriending. So that we can 
after we can see whether there's di different uh, impact of what being a volunteer among those three groups. And at the same time, we also measure whether they, uh, after they uh, learn and deliver the intervention, whether they will uh, practice it themselves, mm. uh, like, like mindfulness or, or behavioral activation. They, they just learn it and deliver it and then they, uh, and then they inter 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 um, internalize it and then they, they, they practice in their daily life. We will try to measure it so that we, it could be a confounding variable in our data analysis later on. Uh, it's, it's, good. it's a very good question. And I was interesting that you're measuring, uh, I saw that you're also measuring impact after six months. And that's really cool because it's not just short-term impact that you're measuring, you're also seeing whether, yeah. Uh, to be honest, I, we want to measure even um, longer period of time, um, maybe one year after the intervention, if you have enough money. And, and I, I, I try to seek other funding to do the follow-up because it's very important to, to learn the long-term effect of uh, one tier as well as those psycho social interventions because we don't have uh, good data on the long-term effect of those interventions. Exactly, and whether people persist with these uh, techniques and these uh, skills that they've learned or not. Yeah. yeah. Great, thank Please. you very much. Uh, I guess we have to move on to the next presentation before we come back to the final, uh, before we come back to the questions related to the previous two presentations. So um, so may I now invite Professor Wu Xin from the UST to uh, share his PowerPoint and start his presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, um, can you see the uh, share the screen now? Hello? Yes, yes, I can see. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, I'd like to uh, present, uh, um, th this is a couple of paper, uh, several of my colleagues and uh, I are working on, and uh, uh, on the, uh, the uh, case of a face mask in uh, during COVID here. Uh, I myself, uh, be, become quite uh, fascinated with uh, the issue of face mask. Uh, just looking at my own uh, behavior at, at the beginning, I think in uh, in January and February, um, I was kind of a, you know strictly follow WHO uh, guideline uh, for not wearing the face mask. But later on, that I can change my uh, you know my own behavior quite uh, quite significantly. So so I kind of start to think about it. You know how the uh, science is actually used uh, in this case. You know when when there's no clear evidence, but then the decision need to be made quickly. So um, the use of face mask has been among the most controversial issue here. If even if you look at uh, today, there are some you know significant uh, differences across different country with regard to uh, the use of uh, a face mask. Right. So on the right, you see this is a uh, the distribution of countries based on the policy. Uh, there are many countries, the majority of countries have shifted to uh, the mandatory use for full country, but there are still countries uh, where face mask is not required. And uh, if you look at uh, uh, the, the timeline um, in terms of uh, how policy have changed uh, in these areas, um, back in April, um, you know, before April, there's uh, only 75 countries I right, um, have guidelines on mandatory use. Um, but then later on, like six months later, you can see that uh, many more countries have shifted to uh, making a fa um, wearing a face mask mandatory uh, in public place. And some countries have uh, made complete reversal uh, of po policies on face masks. So this is an example. Uh, from Singapore, uh, before April, um, you have a guideline issued by um, the uh, the government. Do not wear uh, mask if you are not wearing. Right? This is a, actually uh, you know not not just a no recommendation, but recommend not to wear. Right? 
Uh, so that's actually there's a difference here. But then um, after April, um, there's this uh, uh, mandatory requirement of, of uh, face mask wearing, and there's uh, a fine of uh, 300 Singapore dollars, right? If you do not follow that, so uh, professor, uh, professor, uh, sorry, I we we cannot see the slide. Uh, we we are still on your first page. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, uh, let me. Sorry for interrupt. So maybe I should uh, stop sharing. And Just then, sharing uh, the the slideshow. Okay. Can you see the slide now? Yeah, uh, the first page and then, yep. Okay, yeah. Okay, so okay. so this is where uh, I presented. This is looking at a complete reversal of policy in some country. I'm using Singapore as an example uh, of uh, not recommending uh, the use of a face mask before, but then uh, you know, imposing penalty on not wearing masks in the public places of uh, 300 Singapore dollars here. This is a complete reverse. And this is not only in Singapore, uh, in many countries, they have experienced the same uh, complete reversal of the policy. Right? Um, but it is still divided uh, uh, even within the same country. If you look at the US, uh, the polls show that uh, if you're Democrats, you're more likely uh, to wear masks uh, as compared to a Republican. And also, um, if you look at the, the, the states uh, where the mandatory requirements are issued, uh, this is also divided by whether or not uh, uh, the governors are uh, Democrats or Republican, or whether or not the mayor is a Democrat or Republican. So, so, so the opinions and policies are also sharply divided within the same country, right? Um, so what we know now, I think this is some of knowledge is actually we know back in April uh, that the virus can be transmitted by as a symptomatic uh, patient, right? So that's actually a game changers for a lot of countries so for issuing the mandatory uh, requirement here. And, uh, and then increasingly there's evidence on wearing face mask uh, can prevent the amount and the spread of job late here. So uh, there's more and more evidence come out of it. Um, but despite of this, despite of uh, the same evidence uh, become available uh, or not available before, right? There's still significant differences uh, across different countries. This is actually what, what uh, motivated uh, us for doing this analysis here. This is why, why I got so fascinated about this, right? Because in many areas of a public health, when WHO issues something, when experts say something, we follow, and the, and the every country's citizen they follow here. But in this case, um, despite what expert has been saying, uh, despite the evidences are starting to uh, to come together, there are still significant differences across different countries here, both um, you know several months ago uh, as well as today. So I think this uh, differences um, raised issues about uh, evidence-based policies during a, an unprecedented pandemic here, right? So what is evidence-based policy? Evidence-based policy, policy mean that we should use, uh, we should base our decision on scientific evidence instead of ideologies or common sense, right? So this makes sense, right? We use scientific, uh, evidence here. But the problem is that in an unprecedented pandemic here, the pace of scientific consensus is considerably slower than the speed at which decisions are needed here. We need to make decisions every, you know, like every day um, because this is a concerning uh, uh, life and death situation here. But then the scientific consensus are slowly coming together here. And the other aspect is that we are looking at evolving um, the nature of the evidence here. At the beginning, we didn't know what we know today. And uh, maybe tomorrow, the evidence will show something very, very different from, from what uh, uh, commonly believed today, right? So, so this, is a, this is evolving. And the other thing is there's a standard rigors behind evidence. This is oftentimes 
uh, perceived to be that you have to use the randomized control, simply not available uh, in the time of crisis here, right? So an easy interpretation of this is that the culture must play a very important role. If you uh, look at uh, the uh, the figure on the left to uh, show that uh, Asian are most likely to wear face mask. Um, but this is actually, you know, not entirely uh, the choose. Right? If you look at uh, the figures on the right, you can see that uh, uh, even in these uh, European countries, there are significant differences among these countries in terms of uh, uh, face mask wearings. And so culture plays some role, but obviously there's more uh, to it. So I want to present this um, table to look at uh, what are the choices the government can make with regard to face mask? And then uh, what are the kind of evidences that require to make such decision, right? So you actually you know, can look at, uh, there's a four different policies government can issue with regard to face mask here. They can recommend not to wear face mask um, as the one that uh, was done in uh, early days in Singapore, right? Or issue no recommendation one way or another. You don't have a particular policy here. You completely leave to individuals choices here. That's another one. And then the third one, the recommend wear face mask. Then the last is to make it mandatory, right? So, so those are kind of different policy with uh, the different implications, um, both on benefit and cost uh, uh, of implementing them, right? As well as uh, you know the, uh, the 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 capacities uh, in carrying them out. Uh, then, um, if you look at uh, the role, uh, this indicates uh, various uh, level of uh, evidences that you would need uh, to make those decisions here, uh, range from conclusive evidence that wearing face mask is effective, right? If you have that, I think that a lot of country will shift to making wearing the mask mandatory for sure. Um, or you have some evidence that it works or no evidence, right? So, so there's a kind of difference here. And the, today we can kind of see that uh, uh, th at this space, uh, our knowledge about the wearing of face mask actually uh, evolved over time. Uh, we have a more knowledge about that compared to several uh, uh, last year, early last year. Right? And also then, you know, uh, if you have evidence that wearing the face mask is not effective. So those are kind of different, different uh, kind, of, kind of evidence that uh, would require if you're looking at a different choice here. Now let's look at uh, you know what do we mean by conclusive evidence here, right? Uh, Evidence-based policy requires us to use scientific evidence here. What does that mean, right? This is uh, uh, what we call evidence hierarchy. At the top, you have a systematic review and a meta-analysis of RCT, randomized. Uh, control try, right? And the, you know, next to that, you have a randomized control try. But if you look at the, uh, an unprecedented uh, uh, pandemic like this one, we don't even you know, can conduct a, a full randomized control try given the, the times involved here, not to mention systematic review of such analysis here, right? So this is kind of completely out here. Then, then you look at other, other evidence go down the ladder here. You find that uh, there are other evidences that can be used here, but then their credibility has become a bit different and whether or not they can be considered as conclusive evidences for policy making uh, can differ from country to country here. So at this point, I would say that uh, there are many factors may determine whether or not certain evidences can be used for for the decision purpose on the an unprecedented uh, crisis like we face today, right? Um, lack of a randomized control trial, for example, this is a reality. But then, how you know uh, how low uh, in terms of the ladders uh, that you are willing to move down, right? In in in, in for, for your decision purpose, I think this is a a choices. A confronted decision making uh, decision makers across different countries. So for this purpose, we actually look at uh, uh, for the different countries, and and uh, and these countries are all making some significant changes uh, during the several months from the 
you know, um, early on to the later stage here. Um, and the, we we didn't choose the countries that have been consistent, right? Uh, for a lot of the Eastern Asian countries like China, Vietnam, and uh, Korea and so forth here, the, uh, the policy has been quite consistent here, which uh, leads to interpretation that cultural plays a very important role. So we intentionally look at countries uh, where this, you know, uh, not really the, the, the recommendation of wearing a mask was not made at the beginning, but then there are some changes occurred afterward here. And we look at, uh, you know, the process when, when, when that happened here. So the first case um, is uh, the US, right? Expert initial guideline discourage the use of a face mask, the same uh, as in Singapore. Um, but then uh, in terms of scientific communities, the stand changed once evidence appeared from CDC. Um, but the problem uh, in the US is that the political ideology plays a major role in interpreting the evidences here. So, so some of the, uh, the, the chart I showed earlier uh, indicate that there's a, you know, significant differences in the US across different uh, locality and also different uh, opinions uh, by the general public here. And opinion remain divided along the party line, right? So that's in the US. If you look at UK, uh, the guideline by the government remains skeptical, uh, 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 skeptical. Uh, even, even, you know, today, right? The government actually haven't really, say, con you know, there's a conclusive evidences for suggesting mandatory uh, face mask here, right? So, so if you look at the UK's approach to this, you would say, well, UK really stick to the true uh, evidence-based policy model of requiring scientific evidence, which would require essentially randomized control trial, right? With, without that, uh, you know, that that the, all, all, all the evidence is not good enough, right, to make uh, recommendations of uh, mandatory uses here. But, and then the, the, the use of face mask was viewed as a part of an exit strategy um, for lockdown, right? Because that if, you, if you wanted to exit strategy from lockdown, then you do need to do something different here. So in that regard, you can actually shift towards um, making uh, the, uh, the face mask uses actually more widespread practices, right? Uh, the government couldn't secure supply and ensure the distribution of medical prof uh, professional and general public here. This is a what we feel like a, a plays a very important role in terms of the the gaps in policy capacity here. Although uh, government say that there's a lack of ev uh, conclusive evidence here, but it could be uh, it just uh, you know uh, blame avoidances uh, to hide the fact that that, the, that there's a lack of capacity uh, here. And if you look at Singapore, uh, similarly, uh, you, you know, like in other countries here, discourage the use of face mask initially, but increase domestic production of a mask here, right? So here that there's a level of uh, preparedness is, is quite different in Singapore, although that, uh, you know, they di discourage uh, people from using it if they uh, not feel uh, 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 well. Then uh, you know, government to actually increase domestic production and uh, make preparation uh, that uh, that uh, evidence is contradicting to what they believe earlier would emerge, right? Um, and then you know, as evidence emerged, government mandate the use of face mask um, with punitive measures in place, right? Ensure the distribution of face mask to general public, not just the recommended, but ensure. The distributions, right? So, so this is not many countries have able to do that. Some country make a mandatory, but not necessarily are able to to uh, ensure the distribution or, and the fair, you know, distributions uh, uh, of a mask uh, across the population. Germany um, also um, initially under estimation of the risk, discouraged the use of face mask, uh, but at the same time they banned the export of a protective gear, including face mask here. So in a way that uh, in anticipation that the evidence is contrary to what they believe might emer emerge in the later stage here. Decision was taken by cities despite absence of uh, any conclusive evidence. Um, then the federal structure allow the state to take decision and later on uh, all of them mandate the use of face mask. Okay, so 
we did some comparative analysis looking at uh, uh, the differences uh, among these countries um, based on prior experience. Right? Um, you, among these countries that we look at, only Singapore has prior experiences uh, in such a pandemic, right? um, in, in the case of SARS. And then the polity, we look at the federal, unitary, uh, city-state, uh, cultural, right? So, so um, if you look at the U.S., U.K., and German, Germany being more of emphasized individualism, and the Singapore being part of the Asian country here, collectivism is much emphasized, right? And the policy capacity, there's, uh, you know, we kind of discussed the po policy capacity of sourcing uh, face mask, and uh, this actually can also play a major role. So, the comparative analysis here also point to uh, several uh, factors which we think that uh, play a very important role in interpreting the evidence. Although the evidence is the same, but they got inter interpreted very differently and used very differently. One is the political ideology. Right? In some country, uh, the linking the use of face mask with ideology and subsequent the politicization makes the initial decision uh, very difficult to change. Uh, so that's actually created a certain kind of a uh, past dependence right? um, that you know make it uh, you know uh, create undesirable past dependence in the policy cycle. There's also issue framing, uh, the prevent uh, individualism culture and the issue framing of face mask as an invasion of individual privacy. This has happened in some country here, and then and this this become a barriers in terms of interpreting and inconclusive evidence on face mask here. Yeah. And the policy capacity, like I mentioned, plays a very important role in deciding how these evidences are get used. In some country, uh, the lack of evidence is merely used uh, as a way to, to avoid uh, blames. Right? Um, okay, so I wanted to uh, uh, conclude this uh, presentation in terms of what we learn um, from um, these uh, uh, face mask about the evidence-based policy on the unprecedented uh, uh, pandemic here, right? Uh, obviously, we do not have a randomized control trial, um, but then how to make decisions in such circumstances here. So several principles which we think can be quite important in guiding policy makings uh, in such circumstances, right? Precautionary principle, transparency principle, fairness principle, and adaptiveness principle here. So you know, precautionary principle is that uh, when activity raise threats to harm to human health and the environment, precautionary measures should be taken, even if some cause and effect relationship are not fully established uh, scientifically, right? Uh, so here, the absence of uh, incontrovertible uh, in scientific study supporting widespread ma um, uh, mask use is not the same as evidence that masks are ineffective, right? Uh, so based on this principle, um, you know, giving the gravity of the pandemic here, the indirect evidence of benefit combined with the low risk of harm should outweigh the absence of direct evidence supporting face mask wearing. So, so this is one principle. Can, the second is transparency. Uh, principle here, right? So um, one of the strong reason for not recommended at the beginning is that uh, there's a fear uh, that uh, you may actually uh, deprive the medical workers from this essential equipment here, right? But the problem is that uh, uh, if you say that uh, wearing mask is not effective, so that you you should not wear it, that's a very different thing, right? You can just go ahead saying that we do not have enough mask. But the mask is still important here. Then you leave the individual themselves to make the decision about uh, whether or not they should wear the mask here. So that actually can be quite a, quite important in sharing uh, the limitation of the evidence used uh, for government decision here. Right? Government recommend not use it, but there's no conclusive evidence on that as well, and that should be shared among the public here. That's transparency principle. The fairness principle is also quite important because uh, um, it's, uh, uh, you know, like I mentioned before, the protection of medical work is important. But what about other people who have a close contact with a large group of people, like people working in restaurants and others here, right? And also what about people, you know, uh, people are more vulnerable 
and uh, like elderly and so forth here. So, so in this regard here, the fairness principle you would, would force us to look at uh, not only on certain specific profession, but across board, right, in terms of uh, uh, to make this uh, a fair. And adaptiveness principle is also, you know, quite important. If you look at the cases of Singapore and Germany, uh, although initially uh, they um, uh, advised, you know, against the use of face mask here, but certain preparation has been done um, in anticipation that the evidence that they rely on may proven wrong. Right, so those are kind of important here. You be prepared to make significant changes once ev new evidence uh, emerge. So that's going to adapt in this principle here. So I guess I will just end my presentation um, here. So uncertainty uh, must be tackled systematically. Uh, political ideology and issue framing, policy capacity play a key role in interpretation and use of. Uh, uh, inconclusive evidence right, uh, for the evidence-based policy. And the four principle uh, can be quite important uh, in such circumstances. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Professor Wu. Um, again, very inspiring uh, discussion and, and, and definitely uh, touch on something that is very important uh, throughout this pandemic, which is the use of face masks. Um, again, uh, I would first invite other speakers and the audience to see if they have any questions for Professor Wu first. Uh, Professor Wu, thank you so much um, for, for your presentation. I enjoyed it very much. I think that um, the face mask issue, indeed in Singapore, <laughs> the, 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 the U-turn you know, caused a lot of confusion for us. Um, so I, I wonder in your presentation and your work, uh, do you also include uh, evidence from uh, you know, control of the spread of uh, the pandemic uh, as evidence, right? Because in Singapore, what, what has been, I think, driving us, at least giving us hope, right? And, and that desire to continue to stick to the regimentation is when we saw the incidence rates, you know, remain very low, right? And so... Um, that encouraged many of us to, to grow a very strong uh, trust in the ministry and ministry of health and government, right? The instructions that come. So the validation of government's initiatives is, uh, I, I suspect, you know, very much tied to uh, the pandemic uh, rates, the, in, the rates of, uh, you know, mor morbidity and mortality, Right. Uh, so fundamentally, I think for us in Singapore, it is that notion of trust. Uh, so, so, so a lot of information was rolled out uh, on, first of all, I remember those days when it was front page, you know, <laughs> attached to the newspapers. Don't, don't use a mask if you're not sick, save it for those who need it, right? But I think that's very much tied to, as you already alluded to, the, the, the lack of supply. So the worry that we didn't have enough, so we have to not waste it and save it for the frontline workers. And then, of course, very quickly after that, when we were able to bring in supplies, you know, and free masks were distributed everywhere, then the message changed. And then together with that, the evidence came, right? That, you know, um, all kinds of demonstrations to show that if you have a mask and if the other person has a mask, then droplets, you know, a transmission will reduce the probability. And, and then, of course, the important other, you know, set of uh, uh, indicators for us, and that is the eye on, on the spread of the pandemic locally. Thank you so much, Prof. Wu. Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, that, uh... Yeah, if you look at the evidence, uh, there's a whole spectrum of evidence that can be used for decision making here. And uh, one of the, the key issues we would like to hi uh, highlight in this paper uh, is uh, the, the, the kind of sometime, you know, the, the kind of a blind trust to the randomized control trial, and also that uh, to really pay almost like a cruise attentions on the RCT as opposed to other evidence here. That's actually uh, is kind of, you know, problematic here. I mean, now probably we will have RCT uh, and we will have evidence here. But the key question is that what about in January, in February, when it happened, when we didn't have them, right? What kind of evidence is that uh, we should use and how we treat uh, those evidences um, based on, you know, the, the, the kind of gravity of the issue here. So. 
So I think part of this uh, discussion here is that uh, if you look at some of the principle here, uh, those principle help us to think about it. Uh, at what circumstances uh, uh, we should use, you know, we, we should be satisfied with certain type of evidences here, right? And uh, and the not not just the, uh, uh, restrict ourselves uh, with randomized control trial only, right? because this is a can be a significant mistake. Uh, that that mistakes uh, the cost of that mistake can be, you know, a life, right? Um, life lost. Great, thank you. Uh Professor Capano, uh, welcome. <laughs> and do you have like any questions? Um, good morning, or good afternoon, according to the to the time. No, no just a hi, just a short question to uh, to the show presentation. Uh, two comment, no, two questions. The first one: Have you considered the ambiguous role that they help? Uh, uh, World Health Organization had since the beginning about masks because uh, their advice was really, really ambiguous during all March and April, and this probably has been used in many countries uh, uh, to, you know, to have this ambiguous position on masks. And have you considered that uh, uh, this position could have really driven the initial perception uh, uh, respect to mask, and then it could be it, it could have been very difficult to explain people that against what we have said in February and March, now you should uh, wear masks. Yeah, I think that uh, the pro the probably this will be written in the history book about the WHO's uh, performances during all this, and uh, I think the, their policy with regard to face masks was definitely can be one of them. Uh, here, so so if you look at uh, the kind of choices here, um, that if you look at the policy choices of uh, recommend not to wear and the issue no recommendations, and that's that can be kind of different, right? May make a difference here. So so I would say that uh, uh, at that time, if WHO basically they also don't have the clear evidences here, then certainly they don't necessarily need to come out strongly about uh, re recommending not to use it here, right? Because uh, that's actually send a very uh, strong signal about uh, the level of evidences th that they rely on here. Or at least I think they should, uh, they should uh, um, be transparent about the limitation of the evidences used here. I think, uh, you know, but, but whether or not this is something that I think, uh, you know, uh, that other uh, uh, experts uh, will, will, will agree, right, uh, based on the review of their performances. I think the only, only history can tell. I think that's probably a lot more detail will come out in terms of a decision making uh, process here. But, but I do want to mention that the WHO's policy play more important role in many developing countries. In countries uh, where there's a strong scientific, uh, you know, uh, research tradition, and they they can do things very differently, right? If you look at uh, uh, many countries, they they uh, they don't necessarily follow WHO's uh, stand on this here, but many developing countries uh, they have no choice but rely on them. So so in the future, this is something that uh, that all these principles I mentioned, uh, this is something can be quite important for international. Uh, organizations such as WHO, right? Uh, you know, when, when facing next uh, unprecedented uh, pandemic. Right. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, I I kind of like remember. I I'm not sure whether this also matters to. I think in the very early beginning, policymakers some you know as far as I'm, some policymakers were quite reluctant to advise the use of face masks kind of like because they don't want to create fear among the public. They want to try to, they want to like, well, because masks symbolize the severity of the, of, the, of the disease and many of them were quite, I don't know, I don't have the data here, but it seems to me that many of them were very eager to, to keep business as normal. And, and which looking back, this seems to be quite problematic to, um, yeah, I'm not sure whether that actually pay a role. Yeah, so if you look at all these decisions here uh, that, uh, you know, we can ask the same politician, um, you know, whether or not they would regret 
in making these choices here, right? Those are, of course, uh, uh, it, it, it can be rationalized in terms of what they do in, in terms of protecting, you know, uh, tourism industry prevent, uh, uh, and to boost economy and, and all that here. But in retrospect, and, uh, you know, this is actually, you know, it, this kind of decision uh, cost a lot of lives and, uh, and a significant more more negative consequences than otherwise here. So, so I think uh, it is it is still. I think uh, what 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 we try to do is looking at uh, what government have done uh, in the face mask here to think about uh, how things can be done differently. How uh, some of the considerations uh, should be should be included um, in that decision. Thank you very much, Professor Wu. Uh, I think this discussion leads very nicely to uh, Professor Capano presentation, uh, which will discuss a number of concepts in, in policy design. Uh, so may I introduce, may I invite uh, Professor Carbano to uh, deliver his presentation? Thank you. Thank you. You should uh, see my presentation, I think. It's correct. So I have 20 minutes, right? Huh? 20, 25 minutes, right? Okay. Good morning. Uh, in this presentation, uh, unlike the previous presentation, who were uh, very interested in uh, empirical research, uh, is uh, more conceptual. Uh, it is uh, something on which I'm writing a, an empirical paper, but uh, in this presentation, I'm trying to present uh, the main uh, uh, concept that I have been developing in, uh, in this paper. Uh, I had the idea since the beginning of this uh, unexpected or unprecedented uh, crisis uh, uh, to read uh, as much I, I can, as much I could about uh, all the empirical researches that are uh, uh, being uh, written by social scientists in, in, in every country about this crisis. And so I have tried to, uh, to read uh, this empirical research, uh, trying to understand what we can learn from a policy design perspective uh, uh, from, uh, from, this, uh, from this crisis. So these are the three points uh, I will deal with in my presentation. Uh, general introduction to the, what is uh, from a policy design perspective, the challenge of the COVID-19. I will uh, underline that there are uh, many concepts in policy design in search of facts, uh, concepts like preparedness, resilience, robustness, adaptation, learning, and agility. If you can, uh, uh, if you give a look to all the uh, literature produced in the last year, you can find these words everywhere. No? So the idea was, so oh, let's try to understand how to assess uh, this concept. And then I will try to uh, argue that policy capacities make the difference in terms of preparedness, resilience, robustness, adaptation, learning, and uh, uh, agility. So, uh, first of all, uh, uh, when we try to analyze this crisis from a policy design perspective, uh, we should uh, underline that this is a special type of crisis, is a creeping crisis. I adopt the definition of Boeing and others that define a creeping crisis as a threat to widely shared societal values of life sustaining that evolves over time and space. It is fully shared by precursors uh, events uh, subject to varying degrees of political and societal attention and impartially on insufficient address by authorities. Why I like the definition of a creeping crisis? Because a creeping crisis is the worst type of crisis. It's snaky, it is slippery, it is low, and it develops mostly a death. What's the, the point? Is that a creeping crisis uh, uh, is a kind of uh, crisis where there is an objective nature of the crisis. So you can see its impact, but there is a lot of subjectivity. And this is because uh, uh, the relevance of subjectivity that it could happen that you do not want to see uh, what is going on. And this could create a lot of problems when you try to design the response. Uh, the problem of a creeping crisis is that if you do not recognize immediately, you risk to be always behind. And you, we have seen this in many, many countries around uh, the world. And uh, uh, 
a creeping crisis would impose a policy design capable to detect the first thing in us uh, to, de to deal with the crisis over time. So the point is that either you get that you have uh, uh, to deal with this creeping crazy crisis immediately, or you will always be behind the crisis when try to deal with it. Uh, finally, this creeping crisis uh, as stress not only health care in terms of uh, risk of overwhelming hospitals and the economy, but it has also exacerbated all policy problems that already existed before the crisis. Education gaps, digital divide, racial asymmetry, social vulnerabilities, social inequalities, uh, and, and so on. So we should not forget that uh, uh, one of the characteristics of this kind of crisis is not the in, only the immediate impact uh, in terms of healthcare or economic impact, but also its capacity to emphasize the pre existing problems. What kind of responses can we uh, see in the reality, uh, in comparative perspective, in the last, uh, during the last year? I have a uh, I would say, uh, establish that we could uh, conceptualize, conceptualize at least uh, four or five uh, type of responses. And too often we, re we refer in a very generic way to the response to the COVID-19, but we should be more precise. Uh, the first type of response is the first health response, the healthcare reaction when COVID-19 explodes, uh, then you have the first socio-economic response, all those kind of measures that have been uh, uh, implemented in every country to support uh, people against uh, the economic uh, uh, problems. Then uh, you have the decision about what really to do about the strategy uh, through which deal with this uh, uh, unexpected event. And then we have the dichotomy we can find all around the world between strategies on containment or suppression against the so-called strategy of mitigation. And so on this fundamental decision, we have the divide among the countries in the world. There are those countries who try to almost suppress uh, COVID-19 and uh, other countries who decided uh, uh, to mitigate and then, as uh, uh, they say, to live together with the virus. Then uh, you have uh, uh, another, uh, the fourth type of response, that is the vaccination, vaccination campaigns uh, that should be organized and so on. And finally, we, we will have the redesign of the policy in the post-COVID era. So from a policy design perspective, uh, uh, we could uh, at least uh, find this five type of response uh, on which uh, policies uh, should be uh, designed. Uh, it's quite clear that all these uh, responses call for good policy design to be effective. So, from a, so said, from a, co a comparative policy design perspective, what are the relevant dimensions of dealing with a pandemic? First of all, we have this, we can find uh, this kind of dichotomy uh, between preparedness and unpreparedness. That means substantially between those countries uh, who were prepared to deal with uh, uh, the explosion of the pandemic and those countries that were completely unprepared. But this uh, concept is uh, useful to analyze the first uh, health and economic response in the sense that, you know, you can use uh, and analyze and assess uh, the response of the country in terms of, prepare, of uh, grade or level of preparedness only for the first uh, health and economic response. Then uh, there are other characteristics that matter when the subsequent steps or waves uh, 
should be analysis. That means the other type of responses uh, uh, after the first and economic response. Uh, and these characteristics are related to the robustness, resilience, uh, evidence of learning, improvisation, agility, improvement of policy capacity. So the idea is that uh, substantially we should try to distinguish between the, uh, the preparedness, the level of preparedness for the first response and then the other characteristics of the policy design that are necessary to deal with the other types of responses that you have uh, to produce, uh, to vaccinate people, to decide if uh, suppressing or mitigating the crisis and uh, uh, so on. So uh, COVID-19 outbreak uh, looks to be a perfect uh, uh, perspective to assess uh, the validity or usefulness of some basic and recurrent concept in policy design. Just to in, speaking in terms of preparedness, uh, this is the ranking, uh, the Global Health Security uh, Index uh, per, uh, released at exactly at the end of 2019. Is a common uh, uh, work between uh, the Johns Hopkins University and uh, Economist uh, that uh, ranked the uh, capacity uh, of uh, country to rapidly respond and mitigate the spread of an epidemic. And I found this ranking very funny. Uh, sorry for using this adjective in this dramatic period. Why? Because, uh, you know, this is the ranking you can find highlighted in yellow those countries who have been performed better than others, according to other uh, uh, ranking respect to COVID, and you can see that the first uh, four countries uh, that should be the more capable have been not the more capable in responding to the crisis. So what is interesting here is that uh, uh, the real capacity to respond, uh, uh, to deliver a first response to the crisis uh, looked uh, incoherent with the previous assessment respect to the capacities of the country to respond to a pandemic. So the idea of this uh, uh, index was substantially that the United Kingdom, United States, Switzerland, and the Netherlands had the best procedures and the best health system to react to a pandemic, but the reality has shown a different story and this, I think, should be uh, should be a uh, matter of uh, reflection because I'm quite sure that uh, before, at the end of 2019, many of us could agree that this ranking in terms of uh, uh, potential capacity to respond to a pandemic was uh, reasonable. But then we have seen that uh, what matter was something uh, was something different. Uh, what is the point? The point is that uh, uh, in, in most Western countries, there has been a lot of attention on health organization to justify unpreparedness. The idea was uh, the justification has been that, okay, we had a lot of cut, we had uh, uh, a lot of uh, re reduction in public funding, so we didn't have ICU beds. Uh, uh, and then we, are, we were unprepared. Uh, but uh, the real truth is that while some countries were at a very good health system uh, with strong organization, there was no a real preparedness against the pandemic because there was a substantive uh, uh, lack of uh, PPE. Uh, there was a substantial lack of special procedure and organization dealing with the pandemic. And above all, most of the Western healthcare system were based on, were hospital centric. That means that all the organization of the healthcare delivery was built up again uh, around hospitals that uh, we have discovered is the worst uh, type of organization for dealing with a pandemic because uh, um, if uh, all the uh, healthcare delivery 
is hospital centric. This means that all the potential uh, patient, uh, all the potential people uh, who got the contagion go to the hospital and this creates overwhelming and, uh, and so on. So substantially, notwithstanding uh, that some uh, characteristic of uh, the health system, it was quite clear that uh, in most of the Western countries, the pre-existing policy design was unfit uh, to manage an uh, unexpected uh, event. So said, let's try to uh, better understand uh, uh, after the problem of preparedness or unpreparedness, uh, uh, what is the role, the analytical role of some basic concept uh, in, uh, in policy design uh, according uh, to what I have read. Uh, the first concept is resilience. Uh, resilient is an adjective in the title of this conference. And uh, I try to say here that probably we should pay attention to consider resilience uh, as a, a, a relevant analytical tool when we try to understand uh, this kind of crisis from a policy design perspective. Not only because of resilience has become a kind of, a kind of mantra word also in public policy, but also because uh, it's not clear according to the literature that huge literature in different policy fields about resilience, what really resilience means. So resilience has been defined in terms of capacity to return to the original level of performance of a system. It has been defined as a capacity of a system for returning to this zone after experience disturbance. It has been also defined uh, resilience is uh, what happens after uh, a disturbance uh, of a system adapts and continue operate stably. So the idea is that uh, resilience could be defined also in terms of change of adaptation, transition from the original state to a new state. The real problem with resilience, what I to try, uh, try to say here, is that it is not clear what it, it, it can mean. It means everything. Uh, and this could be a, a problem. So what uh, is clear, not only from the general literature on the resilience, but also on the way to, to which this uh, concept has been used in many, in many studies produced uh, uh, to analyze uh, COVID responses in comparative perspective, is that the concept of, of resilience indicates only broader categories of activities that should be improved uh, but there is no clear this con concept do not provide any kind of clear operative indication to policymakers. so to be resilient to a pandemic uh, could mean many things uh, and all in all uh, we do not know exactly what uh, how we can become uh, really resilient and what we should do to become resilient. So my idea is that we should really pay attention uh, on this. It is interesting that all the governments are working to be resilient against the pandemic, but uh, are we sure that you want to be resilient? Because according to the definition of resilience, you could, uh, uh, you could uh, uh, mean that uh, you want to be resilient, that means to come back to the previous state, or you want to be resilient, that means to adapt to a new situation. So probably this concept is very ambiguous from a, at least from a policy design uh, perspective. So probably uh, the COVID-19 experience suggests to forget uh, resilience, at least as an analytical tool. This, it could be a political word, uh, but from the the analytical tool, uh, analytical point of view could be better to forget the resilience and to focus more on how policy should be designed to respond to pandemics. Uh, from this point of view, uh, we should, uh, uh, we should uh, 
accept that policy designed against a pandemic has two main goals. The first is to avoid the disastrous impact of the disease. And the, third, uh, the second one is to be capable to deal with the magic collateral problems uh, uh, that will, uh, will uh, uh, emerge after a pandemic. This is because uh, other concepts uh, looks to be more uh, promising. The first one is the concept of robustness. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, if uh, policy design is robust when uh, it gives decision maker policy actor the ability to uh, act against the crisis through flexibility, adaptation, agile modification, and pragmatic redirection of policy solution. From this point of view, the concept of robustness could be more useful than the concept of resilience. Why? Because when we design policies against a pandemic, what we want to reach all in all is to maintain the function of the system. You want to try to maintain the capacity of the healthcare to deliver the usual services. You want to maintain the economic function. You want to maintain uh, the other, uh, the characteristic of the other policy. So, uh, robust policy design allows to maintain the function of a system, that means political system, organization, uh, policy, and so on, without resisting to the external ev event, but dealing with it by adopting what is necessary to do to preserve the functionality of the system. All in all, when we react to the pandemic, is try to preserve the functionality of the system. And if you see in comparative perspective, uh, all the responses uh, uh, that have been adopted in the country, some more successful than others, uh, have uh, as a main goal to preserve the functionality of, uh, of the system. And then we can see that uh, the, some countries uh, with a, a structural, more robust uh, policy design have been more capable to deal with the pandemic, like Asian, like Asian countries, uh, New Zealand, Australia, and partially Finland and Norway. Uh, why? Uh, how they have been more capable? Either uh, they were prepared or also they immediately decided to go for containment. This is uh, the main characteristic. While other countries have shown less policy robustness, and then they have shown to be more agile, less agile, flexible, evidence-based, uh, driven, and learning. And they went uh, for mitigation. So this is quite interesting from my point of view, is that those countries we have more robust policy design and we are more capable uh, to deal with the pandemic and most of them went uh, for this strategy of uh, deep containment, uh, almost, uh, almost uh, uh, suppressing strategy, while the other countries is not the case with a less robust uh, uh, policy design went for, uh, for mitigation. Regarding learning, another a relevant word in uh, in policy design, we have to say we have to uh, to accept the idea that we can see very low learning by doing in this crisis. Uh, this should be accepted. The impression is that uh, in many countries, especially in the Western world, uh, we have uh, we have seen uh, what it has been called Corona nationalism in the sense that we can see that many most of the countries have adopted their own interpretation of this crisis. We can see that in various countries there has been a repetition of the same cognitive scheme over time. Uh, uh, this schema uh, is based on four steps, denial, normalization, recognition, and awareness. If you see the way to reach in many countries, especially in the Western world, uh, uh, they, uh, the, the different waves of the of the pandemic has be, have been dealt with. We have to admit there has been not learning 
uh, by doing it. Otherwise, we cannot justify what happened uh, between the first and the second wave. After uh, the first wave, at least uh, in the Western world, uh, we had a very relaxed summer and substantially nothing has been done to prepare uh, the second wave. So this is very, very, very interesting uh, from uh, this point of view. So we should assume that learning by experience cannot happen so fast as needed. And this uh, is a question you should, uh, you should try to, to answer respect all this literature emphasizing the fact that policymaker should learn by uh, doing. And uh, uh, we could make the hypothesis that this lack of learning uh, can depend on the cognitive mass of decision manner on contextual, political, societal, and administrative barriers. So this is a topic to be analyzed in the future. Uh, I think I have other four minutes. Uh, I don't know. Uh, re respect to the other uh, used concept, uh, uh, agility, flexibility, adaptation, that are very used now in policy design. Uh, they have been used in the, in the recent decades uh, to indicate the way to do good policy design. We have to observe whether that uh, agility and flexibility in policy design implies the capacity to change the decisional and administrative path on time according to the actual uh, challenge. So it's quite clear that uh, if you want to pursue proactive adaptation with respect to a crisis, you need it to be agile and also flexible. But uh, what COVID outbreak has shown is that agility and flexibility are not originated from nothing. It does not happen for chance that you can be agile and flexible in responding to a pandemic. And Again, also that the proper adaptation uh, in time that you need to do in time of crisis cannot, apt, cannot happen if there is no preparation to adapt. So what we are learning from this crisis is that too often we use concepts like agility, flexibility, adaptation, without considering all the characteristics, the conditions that are needed to have this kind of reaction. And then the last point. So I can cite uh, one uh, uh, of the uh, panelists of this uh, plenary, uh, what I'm trying to say. Uh, all in all, uh, what uh, emerges uh, uh, from uh, this crisis uh, is that, uh, okay, not, not only that policy capacities makes the difference, but uh, something more that policy capacity uh, on the characteristic of policy capacities uh, uh, depends on uh, your chance to be robust, agile, flexible, and so on. So we should, uh, I would say, uh, reverse the, the logic of reasoning. Huh? And uh, this is the, uh, one of the scheme of uh, policy capacities proposed by uh, uh, Shunru, Michael Allet, M. Ramesh. Uh, this scheme has been adopted in many policy fields. I think, however, that, uh, that the lessons uh, coming from COVID-19 uh, are telling uh, that this scheme should be developed exactly to understand how uh, some characteristics that we think to be important uh, to reply, to respond to a pandemic, or like robustness, agility, learning, and so on, uh, depend on the policy capacity. In fact, uh, uh, we can see that the different policy capacities, uh, uh, in comparative uh, perspective, make the difference in terms of robust policy design, adaptive policy design, capacity of learning, agility and flexibility. We can now what emerges, uh, at least from uh, the empirical research has been done right now, is that 
the higher the analytical capacity, the more likely that the creeping crisis is seen as an objective problem calling for immediate uh, constant uh, attention. Uh, if analytical capacity, that means uh, uh, the capacity to, uh, you know, to, or, uh, to organize the information and so on, is low, is less probable that the objectivity of, uh, of the pandemic in, immediately emerge, and then you can have all this framing about the fact, okay, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's simply a flu, it's a stronger flu and so on. If you, if you remember, probably not in your country, but in, in my side of the world, during January and February, uh, COVID-19 was a Chinese uh, uh, issue. And many, also many experts, many virologists uh, in Italy, France, uh, Germany, until the mid of uh, February, uh, were used to say that, come on, it's something like a flu. So the higher the analytical capacity, the more probable that you can immediately grasp the reality, real objectivity of the problem. Uh, the higher the organizational capacity and more likely the chance to give effective responses to proceed accordingly to the following step, and the higher the political capacity, the more likely either to decide for containment and suppression or to be highly coherent designing intervention when the choice has been mitigation and not suppression. Pre-existing policy capacities pre-structure the value type of response of a pandemic. I know that is not uh, very promising to say this, but this is what is emerging if you compare the different uh, cases. At the same time, pre-existing policy capacity are the main drivers of the quality of the preparedness as well as the quality of uh, the policy design following the explosion of the crisis. The stock of policy capacities you have before the crisis drives, uh, you can like, you can dislike what you can do, also because it's quite difficult that in the short run, you can change the characteristics of your policy, uh, of your policy uh, capacities. Political capacities look essential to decide the path to follow in responding to all the subsequent challenges. Analytical and organizational capacity are essential to design policy properly and thus to design robust, agile, flexible, and learning-oriented uh, responses. Learning by doing happens only where there is alignment among the three types of capacity. This is something that should be tested, but the impression is that the more the three capacity are aligned in a system, the more probable that you can learn something during a crisis. The last uh, slide, sorry for a little bit, bit longer. Uh, finally, my, my suggestion is that policy design approach should capitalize on this dramatic event, but you know, as a scholar, so we should try to capitalize on everything happens to coherently conceptualize the relations among the policy capacity and the characteristics of the possible policy designs. Uh, we know that to deal with a pandemic, preparedness is necessary. We can like, we can dislike this. Uh, preparedness means also to adjust the existing policy capacities to future challenges. Next global challenges and possible crises call for a policy for policy robustness, the capacity to maintain function while even adapting to a new context in policy design, and thus for a significant redesign of the structural characteristics that could allow highly performing policy capacities. Sorry for have been probably five minutes long. No, no, really.
not really. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Cabano. Uh, very inspiring uh, presentation. I, I can see a lot of dialogue here between your presentation and Professor Wu's presentations and on policy design, on the concepts that are relevant um, and, and concepts that should should be kind of like reflected upon due to uh, upon the, the outbreak of the COVID-19. So uh, again, uh, may I know if the audience and other panelists have any questions, immediate questions about uh, for for Professor Capano. Right. Um, I have one very quick question. I wonder if uh, Professor Cabano, you can like further elaborate um, the the differences between when you when you talk about when you compare the concept of robustness and resilience. You said that well. Robustness focus on the fun preserving the functions of the of the system, uh, whereas uh, resilience is about one interpretation of resilience is about returning to the previous stage. So, so in what sense, uh, what can you elaborate more on the differences between what is it? What are the differences between preserving the functions of the system and 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 how does it differ from? From 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 the original from the understanding of resilience that we want to preserve or 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 return to how things would were done previously. Sure, thanks. Uh, you know, one of the problem with the, all the resilience literature is that, uh, as I I have summarized very quickly in the presentation, is that resilience could mean many things. Uh, it could mean to come back to the previous situation but could be also mean to be capable to adapt to, to a new context. And this, you know, <clears throat> is, a, a, is, a, is a, we were used to say, is a kind of holistic property of a system, you know what I mean? But when you do policy, at the front of a crisis, uh, your, first, uh, uh, your first goal is try to allow policy to function as expected, you know what I mean? If you think uh, uh, when you when you have uh, to give the first response to, to, to this disease, uh, your first goal is to avoid overwhelming of hospitals. You know what I mean? Because if hospitals are overwhelmed, then all the other diseases cannot be uh, taken care. So the point here is that uh, to maintain the functionality of the system means to try to deliver the usual output and outcomes in every policy field, in every context, you know what I mean? While resilience uh, uh, could mean to come back to the previous state, you know, but so it's something different. To be resilient, uh, to be resilient cannot ensure you to be capable to not uh, uh, defend the hospital for, uh, for overwhelming, first point. Second point, uh, do you really want to come back to the previous situation? Usually this kind of crisis uh, are very dramatic, but then uh, open opportunities for interesting and uh, you, you know, promising changes, you know what I mean? So why we should come back to the previous situation while probably after we will, uh, we, we, we will be, we, we will be capable to, to deal this uh, the dramatic side, this crisis uh, will offer opportunity for some positive changes. You know, the, this is because my personal opinion, but you know, uh, there is disagreement in the literature, is that resilience is an interesting concept, maybe, uh, you know, uh, for some political programs, but from the analytical point of view, although there is a big literature in the uh, so-called ecosystem field speaking about the resilience of ecological system personally i think that from a policy perspective resilience is a, a metaphor that is not very useful analytically if you want to design policy capable to reach their goal all right um okay thank you very much for the for the illustration um i think we can have a you know, like now since all four presentations have been done, and I think we can now have a gather 
we can gather all the presenters and have a joint discussion. Now, before before we do that, uh, I remember that we have one questions from the audience that we have not addressed yet, which is from Victoria, Victoria, uh, and it's for Professor Chow. Um, so she, she is asking. For, the technical details of the experiment. So what would be the value of the intervention? Because during any type of pandemic, it would be likely that community centers will be closed during the intervention through phones would mean that a certain group of people could not be reached. Yeah, so we actually we deliver the intervention uh, through the telephone. So we, we will make sure that uh, um, they have a uh, uh, telephone at home, and they really could communicate uh, with them uh, over the phone. All right. So thank you very much. Now I think uh, since all four papers, so uh, now we can have a group discussion here. Since all four papers are about the COVID nineteen, and obviously the COVID nineteen is still an ongoing process here. Um, uh, I think as policy researcher. Uh, we would be very interested in, in drawing lessons from, from COVID-19. And over the past year, we have already seen a lot of papers being published. And, and, and now we are also seeing in today's discussion, we are seeing a lot of interesting work being done as well. Uh, um, the COVID-19 obviously challenged our existing understanding uh, of certain important concepts in, in public policies, like whether what is the role of evidence uh, in, in policy making. Um, what is resilience. And then at, at the same time, it also, we affirm the importance of some concepts or some values like connectedness, uh, that the importance of being, connect, being connected, um, the importance of, um, of being included in the society. It seems to me that while well, the COVID-19 are drawing a lot of, are giving a lot, a lot of lessons. So as I'd like a kind of like concluding remarks, uh, I would wonder if, the panelists could share uh, what are the like key well key research agenda for the future um, and along with you know what just what you have just presented and and also I would also be very interested in 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 I I'm I'm having one question right now is like whether we are drawing conclusion too early or too quickly sometime um, because right um, because. It seems to me that while we generally have an understanding that the Western world, um, United Kingdom, the United States seems to be not performing very well uh, in the face of this pandemic. Uh, but at the same time, if we look at a long, look at this from a long term, more longer term perspective uh, with the arrival of the vaccines and, and all this development, it seems to me that, well, these countries are still very resilient in the sense that their technologies, their their knowledge base, their civil society uh, are, are responding to the pandemic, uh, but in a very different way, although they will suffer from you know, huge casualty in the very beginning. But then um, I'm, I don't know, what is the next phase of the development of the pandemic? Are they going to recover uh, because of their advancement in the technology? And how would that change our evaluation right now? So, so these are some of the, my random thoughts uh, just to, you know, <laughs> start the discussion. Mm. So perhaps I, I would take the liberty of going first. I think the pandemic, um, this pandemic has been, uh, it has caused unprecedented disruption to the way of life that we have come to appreciate. So it's important for us, I think, to move forward with new lenses and not assume that the traditional inequalities uh, still persist and I think for us to be even more appreciative now, you know, of evidence, right? Because it is a new norm and we, we, the dust has not set it yet. So in terms of, um, you know, looking at the inequalities that have surfaced, um, we find new groups who are now uh, without jobs, right? Um, without resources and uh, without, without the future that they, they were used to. Uh, so my, my, uh, my, my, my colleagues and I, our focus is on uh, the older adults because of the nature of Rosa. Um, so even within, you know, this group, we see that, you know, the jostling of, you know, who is, who is stuck at the bottom, 
who is able to emerge stronger from this um, is, is something that we are, we are much humbled right, by the evidence that comes in. Um, so I think for us, moving forward really is, um, for a small country like Singapore, the over-reliance on, on government is always not sustainable. Right? So we are now learning to look at um, what are the self-help mechanisms that we can encourage. Um, the 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 people to people kind of connections, right? And to look at um, our our audience, which is the the post uh, fifty group, right, as very valuable resources in their communities, in their respective communities, and how do we you know give them you know that the, the the kind of leverage they need to to lead and be proactive in charting the recovery forward. Um, my second and last point would be that from an evidence perspective, we must also render visible and give a voice to those who have fallen through the cracks. So taking you know, your, your last question, your, your last pointer, Suyan, and that is you know, how will the, the Western economies and, and you know, societies emerge from this? They will remain strong, they will remain ahead. Uh, certainly, if you look at the macro perspective, I don't think there will be any country that will fall off the face of the earth, right? Um, because macro trends will always tell you, you know, um, where, where, the co where the collective is heading. However, in the process, there will be uh, groups who will be dropped off, right? Because um, this, this is what happens in reality, uh, that, you know, those who can will move forward. Our data, uh, so we track economic well-being as well. Our data shows that um, the, the top earners remain the top earners and they collect even more wealth, right, in this period. Um, they spend less, they spend a lot less, but, but that's because we can't travel. So those are the luxuries, right, that, they, that you know, those who can afford to give up. And because they spend less, they save more, right? Instead of $20,000 spent on, you know, a vacation overseas, now they have a $20,000 extra in their bank account and so on, right? So I think what we want to do, um, for us at least, is to make sure that we give sight and voice to the ones who, are, who have been marginalized. And of concern for us are the new poor, right? So the digitally disconnected is one group that uh, certainly you know, requires a lot more intervention from us. Then the second thing that, uh, the, second, the, the second concern we have is the notion of employability, right? When we deal with older adults uh, who are you know, in 50 to 55 group, Unfortunately, in terms of public policy, you know, uh, in terms of in concerns on, on, on employability and jobs, the focus is always, well, I suppose it's fair to be on the younger ones, right? So a lot of attention and worry on school leavers, you know, those with family responsibilities. But our data tells us that those who are in the 55 and above group continue to require sustained employab employability, income stability, because they have to live for another 40 years or so, right? <laughs> we come to the point where longevity means that you can't just, you know, die off, right? You have to continue to survive and you have to continue to thrive. And employment becomes, you know, even more important for this group. So moving forward then, I think a lot of curation is, um, we call on governments and employers to be more creative in you know, in uh, looking at employability of the post-50 group, rather than keep telling them, go for training and retraining, upskilling, so that make yourself relevant. Um, we think that, you know, it's important to look at this group as resources, right? And look at what kind of skill sets they have and then create jobs that will leverage their skills. So let me give you a, an example to round off. Um, you know, we are very proud of Singapore Airlines. Mm. We never, never, never dreamed that Singapore Airlines will stop flying like that, right? It was a yeah. big shock for all of us. So what do we do then with all our flight stewardess and crew? They have so much invested in them, right? They, they are a, a, amazing service ambassadors in the sky. And suddenly they have no jobs. What do we do? Well, we looked at their skills and we created jobs for them. 
They are now service ambassadors. So as I speak now, many of them are in the community centers today and the malls distributing the fourth round of free masks. Right? And, and then they are in the front lines in, in, in health care uh, institutions and quarantine facilities because they are so good at service provision. So they become our front line on the ground. Right? So similarly, for our older adults, this is what we're calling for. Do not write them off. Look at what resources they are to us, to the community, and then create opportunities for them to continue to contribute. So for those with means, like Prof Chow had alluded to, volunteerism has to be forefronted, right? So we have to then valorize volunteers and give them a, a social prestige in our communities because rewards must be beyond just, you know, an annual income, which is important. We reward people through other means as well. Prestige, respect, you know, giving them a position in our in our community are uh, important, you know, uh, you know, thought sources that we need to rethink. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Chong. Uh, yeah, I, I think one of the very important lessons from the COVID nineteen really is to that, that is to give energy to the society, and so that no one will be excluded. All right. Uh, may I invite other panelists to see if they have anything to add to the discussion? Uh, because I, at the same time, I also see Studi seems to have a questions for Professor uh, Professor Wu and Professor Capano. It, it wasn't really a question. It was more of a comment that uh, just analytical capacity in developing countries is likely to be limited. And it's something which Prof Shun mentioned as well. And um, especially because they also often tend to engage in like a mimetic policy isomorphism when they're looking to other nations or international organizations to see what policies are being followed. So to some extent, I believe policy design in developing countries would be constrained by this lack of analytical capacity. And that was just the comment. So I don't want to take up more time. Uh, right, okay. Um, so... May I say something? Sure, sure. No, no, because I was, uh, I found uh, what uh, Pauline has sent quite uh, interesting and challenging. Uh, obviously, uh, while she was uh, talking, I was thinking, okay, but you are in Singapore, you know what I mean? In the sense that uh, what uh, you were saying is very interesting and fascinating. I know a bit Singapore, how it works. Uh, and uh, uh, so what you have said is more difficult to be found uh, or to be constructed in other other side of the world, you know what I mean, for many reasons that we know. Uh, this is one of the points, I think, is that uh, we do not exactly uh, what could be the long-term effects of this uh, crisis, you know what I mean, uh, some, uh, some uh, historians have said that this crisis is like a, a world war in terms of effect. Other historians have said, uh, you know, but we had a big, a big pandemic exactly one century ago with uh, from uh, 50 to 80 millions of, of deaths. I'm speaking of the Spanish flu and this Spanish flu has been lost in our memory. So we do not know exactly I agree on the fact that probably there will be more poor groups all around the world. Uh, and this could be very problematic from my point of view uh, in the Western so-called democratic world, because this could uh, be conducive to a kind of destabilization of this, of this political system. This is the first uh, uh, point uh, of view. So the fact that uh, there will be political consequences of the effects of this, uh, of this crisis, according to the capacity of the countries to really recover. Second, there will be probably more inequalities. Uh, uh, this is for sure, because as I, I told them in my presentation, because COVID-19 has exacerbated, uh, has emphasized, has made uh, uh, bigger some problems that already existed. For example, the digital divide in many countries uh, 
you have a relevant digital divide between social groups and this digital divide has been increased. So I'm not, uh, uh, from a realistic point of view, I think that uh, uh, there could be opportunities from this crisis, but all in all, I think that there will be some, uh, I would say, unexpected for now uh, political consequences. Then uh, the last point, uh, uh, from uh, the international uh, point of view, the impression is that uh, there will be changes in the you know, world alliances and international politics uh, uh, dynamics. This is quite clear. If you think that uh, something that is very relevant uh, for coming out, uh, for recovery you know, from the crisis, that is vaccines uh, are actually used as tools uh, of foreign policies by many countries, you can see that the geopolitical landscape could be really affected and changed by this, uh, by this crisis. So I think that uh, as scholars in public policy, we should pay attention uh, to these dimensions. And from a prescriptive point of view, we should really push uh, uh, the public opinion attention to the risk that the as uh, Pauline said, uh, the number of marginalized people could be, could could become very high in 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 value system. And again, the more you marginalize people, and the more you have a risk of destabilization of the usual dynamics of your political system. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, just, uh, well, I think we, we are running out of time now, so we probably have to finish here. But uh, before we finish, uh, well, there are some questions uh, here in the, in the Q&A box. So if the, uh, if, if the panelists have time or find it relevant, you may actually answer them. Um, and, but, but I, I, I yeah, I, I I find today's discussion very inspiring, as usual. Um, the, these surprisingly, all these uh, presentations seems to synergize with with others very well. Um, talk about the, the how COVID nineteen uh, has impacted everyone, and how how as policy in in policy making, uh, how we might have to change our mindset in response to the pandemic or in response to future crisis like this. Um, and I'm very grateful for uh, the opportunity to learn from every one of you and I'm very thankful for your time uh, and also all the audience who participate in today's discussion. Um, and, and I would encourage you to continue to participate in the other sessions that we will have this afternoon. And, and before we finish this uh, section, uh, I think we have to take a group picture, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so um, Michael, are you still here? Maybe, yep. Wait, okay, um, so. Okay, ready. Three, <laughs> two, three, two, one. And, oh. Three, two, one. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, everyone. Um, yeah, um, um, yeah, uh, yeah. Again, thank you very much, and enjoy. And I wish that you will enjoy today's um, conference. And I wish you all the best. In and looking forward, I'm looking forward to reading your papers as well. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.